and I'm going to record this. Hi again. Um, we'll get started here. I just want to make sure everybody is aware of some of the icons along the bottom. If you have a question as we go along, you can enter that in the Q&A box. That makes it easier for me to keep track of those questions. If it's important, I can interrupt Dr. Hemingway and she can answer it as we go or we'll save everything for the end. At the conclusion, I can give you permission to unmute if you want to raise your hand and I can call on you. We have a big crowd that signed up. Not sure how many will join us live, but just makes it easier if we hold off on questions till the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hemingway and she can get us started. All right, thank you, Nancy. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, we're gonna discuss this new guidance that's coming down the pike from the FDA about access to antibiotics that you can cur currently purchase uh, at your feed store or at Tractor Supply. Um, first, I kind of wanted to give an idea of why can't I do that now? Uh, it was working, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you put your arrow down at the bottom left-hand corner, there should be little arrows to help advance. No. Oh, okay, I see, I'm, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Technically challenged. Oh, um, that's all right. So I figured I, I would talk first about why they're doing this. Um, there is a concern regarding resistance to from bacteria and fungal agents to our, our drugs that we use to treat, especially in human medicine. In fact, I just heard in the news the other day that there is a fungal infection from a Canadia type of uh, agent that um, is appearing in hospitals that are that is becoming more and more resistant to the agents that they treat it with. And there is a concern about where this is going. And so the FDA is is focused on this concern and they are talking to all of the different sectors in how antibiotics are being used. Uh, they're addressing it with overprescribing of antibiotics in human medicine, as well as looking at how they are being used in pets and of course in food animals as well. And we have to recognize that bacteria, they change over very rapidly. And every time they get exposed to a chemical or an antibiotic, that gives them the ability to evolve and get better at evading that antibiotic. So we may kill some of it, but the, the bacteria that is left becomes more and more resistant to those antibiotics that we are using. And it's just through natural selection. And especially if, if antibiotics aren't used properly where not enough of the dose is being used or it is not being used for an enough long time so we get a good kill of that bacteria, what is left are the more resistant bacteria. And then it just is a slippery slope to um, more and more of those resistant bacteria being out there. And we have less tools to be able to treat infections. And they've also found that bacteria is very good at evolving naturally to become more resistant. And they're finding that bacteria that are even close to each other can exchange genetic material. So if one bacteria has been exposed to antibiotics and has resistance genes, it can pass it to neighboring bacteria. And, and they have seen that in the environment. So there's a lot of things that we don't understand with this, but um, the growing concern is being seen with this um, resistance in bacteria, especially. And it's very costly and it is becoming a concern regarding human health. And it is a global concern. Uh, the World Health Organization has seen this in many countries. Um, some countries are seeing a, a lot bigger problem than what we see here in the United States. So the FDA, because of this, has created a strategy called the Judicious Drug Use Strategy to create a goal to slow the emergence of antibiotic resistance. They realize that they're not gonna be able to stop this, but if they can implement changes to 
make drug use a little um, more judicious use, then there's less out there for that bacteria to get exposed to so they can slow that, that resistance from growing. So their strategy is to target medically important antimicrobials or antibiotics. And medically important antibiotics are ones that are shared between human medicine and animal medicine. They're looking at how these particular drugs are being used in food producing animals, and they want to make sure that when they are used in these animals, it is only for animal health, for prevention and treatment of illnesses. And when they are used, they will be under the oversight of a veterinarian. So the FDA has deemed the veterinarian as the gatekeeper to assure that these drugs are being used wisely. Now we have to recognize that an antibiotic is a drug, but not all drugs are antibiotics. So this particular strategy and the changes that are coming down are only looking at antibiotics because of the concern of that growing resistance. But other drugs such as vaccines and dewormers and hormones, since they're not antibiotics, they are not going to be affected by this new ruling. And I also wanted to mention about AMDUCA, which is the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act of 1994. At that time, veterinarians were given the authority through this law that they could use human drugs to treat food animals, to improve animal health. And this gives them the opportunity to use these drugs called extra labely, and we'll go into that definition so that we have access to these human drugs. The main thing to remember is that in order for that to happen, the veterinarians have to have a relationship with these farms in order for them to prescribe medications. And that is the main thing about what the FDA wants to see is that these farms have that relationship with a veterinarian um, so that we can assure that these drugs are being used appropriately. Within this law, there are drugs that are off limits or restricted uh, to food producing uh, farms, such as antibiotics like chloramphenicol. It's a very effective antibiotic, but because it can cause cancer in people, um, it is prohibited to be used in any food producing animal. And there's also other drugs that are restricted in how they can be used, um, especially they have to be used according to label. You cannot use them um, anything different than what's listed on the label. And an example of those would be XNL or Naxel or Exceed. Those, um, we can use those in food producing animals, but we have to use them according to the label. And when we talk about extra label drug use, we are talking about looking, reading the label, seeing how um, they're to be used. And if we go off of that label, it's called extra label. So if we're using it in a species that is not listed, or if we're giving it to a different age or classification, such as the label states, you can use this in calves less than two months or two years of age, and you're using it in a lactating dairy cow, that's off label, any indication that's not listed on the label, it's listed for BRD, for respiratory disease, and you decide to use it for metritis, that is extra label. Of course, using it at a different dosage or increasing the frequency or using a different route, those are all extra label uh, uses as well. And we have to remember that Withhold times are very important when we're administering drugs to food animals. We want, we want to make sure that residues are not occurring from our drugs that are we putting into these animals that may end up into the food supply. So anytime that we use a drug that's off label or anything different from the label, we have to consider adjusting that withhold time. If you're using a higher dosage, that automatically means that you need to hold that animal out longer. And that's where the veterinarian can help you make those decisions. So currently there's three classifications of animal drugs. There's the over-the-counter, which means that anybody can purchase uh, from anybody who's selling. There's no restrictions. 
There's the prescription class, which is uh, either sold directly from a veterinarian or they write you a prescription and you go to a pharmacy to purchase it. And then there's the veterinary feed directive, which is a category that uh, addresses antibiotics that are used in animal feed. And that was designated to make it easier to treat animals in larger groups where they didn't have to write a prescription for the individual animals. And if you remember back in 2017, there was a new directive from the FDA addressing antibiotics that were available over the counter uh, that was uh, removed from that status and moved to the VFD. And those were medically important antibiotics um, that were labeled at the time for growth promotion and improving feed efficiency. For example, the oromycin crumbles, uh, the tetracycline crumbles, those were common things that you can go into a feed store and purchase and then top dress on the feed for your animals. Because of the, uh, they were medically important and because of their continual use on a lot of farms, the FDA wanted to restrict those, those products. So they had the companies change the label and then they removed them from the shelves. And like I said, now you have to work with a veterinarian for them to write a VFD order for you to get access to those drugs. And that also limited the ability to use those products extra labely. They have to be followed exactly what's on the label. Um, there's no wiggle room on that. So like I said, the tetracyclines, the tylosin and the neomycins were the most affected. And this really made a difference. Um, the tetracycline, sales uh, in animal agriculture decreased quite a bit. And the drug residues that we were seeing for neomycin uh, went down quite a bit as well. We were seeing residues from that product from medicated milk replacers <clears throat> that contained the neomycin product in it. And once that was restricted, those residues dropped dramatically. Now, the other part of this that's coming this year is targeting those medically important antibiotics um, that are injectable and oral and intramammary from over-the-counter access to needing a prescription. And the deadline is June 11th. What the FDA did was go to the companies that produce these products, told them they needed to change the label to add the cautionary statement that federal law restricts the use of this drug by or on the order of a licensed veterinarian. So that means that um, you have to work with the veterinarian to get a prescription in order to get access to these drugs. So once they have the revised labeling on that, that's when a prescription will be required. So this is a list of the antibiotics that are affected by this new ruling uh, and some product examples. So the cefafirin antibiotic is in the intermammary tubes today and tomorrow. Lincomycin, the injectable uh, lincomix, lincomed, uh, oxytetracyclines, uh, the injectables, the LA-200, the biomycin-200, along with the boluses, um, the scour tablets and the calf boluses. The penicillins um, are going to be transitioned, so the injectable ones, um, you know, the procaine pens, and then the intramammary tubes uh, that treat mastitis, like the Albidry Plus. All of the sulfas are going to be transitioned uh, the injectables, as well as the boluses, so for the calf boluses in particular, uh, and tylosine, um, Thailand 50 and Thailand 200. If you want a more complete list of the products, you can go to the FDA website um, and it will give you a list of, of all of those products. But if you're using a product that's not listed here, but it has penicillin or Oxytet in it, then it will be transitioned because they're targeting those medically important antibiotics. Again, if it's not an antibiotic, um, it's not going to be affected. Now, there are some antibiotics that are solely used in animals, such as the ionophores or the menensin, the bovitex, the rumensin, 
because they're only used in animals, these they're not going to be affected by this new ruling because they're not used in humans. And then of course, other drugs that are not antibiotics um, are also not going to be affected by this. So your dewormers and your coccidiostats, for example. So what's your first step to deal with this? If you wanna to continue to get access to these antibiotics, um, you will need to find a veterinarian. And um, the best step is to ask your neighbors, ask your fellow producers in your area, uh, ask them who they work with, find out what veterinarians are in your area that do food producing uh, animals and see what the best fit is for, your, for you and your operation. Um, the veterinarian works under what the VCPR, which is the veterinary client patient relationship. And that is defined by the state and the federal government. And um, there is a complete definition. There's three parts of it. And this is the New York state and the federal government. They're very similar. Other states have different definitions, but essentially that veterinarian as soon as he starts working with you has assumed the responsibility for making medical judgments for your animals. And then you as the client agree to follow their instructions. Now for that veterinarian to make that, those, those judgments, they need to have sufficient knowledge of your animals and of your operation. And the way they do that is to make timely visits to your facility. And timely visits is not defined in New York State. It usually defaults to annual visits at the minimum. However, there are some vet clinics that uh, wanna do more visits throughout the year. Um, I know of one clinic that wants to do quarterly visits in order to maintain that VCPR. Uh, another one that does every six months. So it really de determines what vet clinic you end up working with as to how often they need to be out there visiting with you and looking over your operation in order for them to maintain that relationship. So the VCPR in regards to the FDA, that is really the only hold they have on how these drugs are being used in, in animal agriculture. So they, they have teeth in that with the veterinarian pretty much because they have a license to protect. So if a farm gets a hold of drugs and are using them without that oversight from a veterinarian, then the FDA sees that as uh, illegal and that it is sending adulterated food into the food supply. Now, if you're, if you're not sure um, or you don't have anybody to discuss with about who they use for veterinarians in your area, you can go to the New York State Veterinary Medical Society website, um, the nysvms.org. They, um, on the front page, they have up in the upper right-hand corner, a tab that says pet owners. And, and I realize that's a bit of a misleading tab, but if you click on the tab, you will find this drop down menu that gives you the option of what clinics around the state work with large animal and food production. And if you click on that, it will actually give you a list of vet clinics around the state and it'll map it out for you. So that might help you identify um, vets and clinics in your area that you can possibly approach about setting up a relationship. Now, I thought I'd go into some questions that have been posed uh, to us. Um, one question is, what if I buy a whole bunch of these drugs and stockpile it? Because the FDA is really not going to target anything that doesn't have the new label on it. They're not going to go gunning for the old products. They're going to let the new products wash through the system and um, and deal with it as it comes along. So you could potentially go out and buy a whole bunch of um, LA 200 and store it and use it and not need to work with a veterinarian until you need to buy some new ones with the new labeling on it. But there is a word of caution because 
these products do have expiration dates. And if you don't use a lot of this, then it may not be the best investment to go out buy a bunch of this and then it just expire and lose its efficacy. So be aware that um, it is important to look at the expiration dates and depending on your operation and how much of these antibiotics that you use, whether that's a, a good thing to do. Um, and also when we're talking about expiration dates, you wanna make sure that you're storing these products appropriately so that you can maintain the effectiveness. They need to be refrigerated or, or stored in a cool, dry place um, where there's not a lot of temperature changes or sunlight because that can reduce their efficacy as well. And then as soon as you open the bottle or pierce it with a needle, you're letting air get in there and then that can actually make the degradation go even faster. So make sure that that is a wise decision uh, if you're going to think about stockpiling. And then the other thing to consider is that if you use an antibiotic extra labely, then you need to have that veterinarian oversight according to AMDUCA. Um, so penicillin is the best example of this. We all know that for penicillin to be effective, it automatically needs to have a higher dosage rate than what's on the label. So technically, for you to use that in food producing animals, you need to have that relationship with a veterinarian and for them to have oversight on how you're using that penicillin. Another question that we got was to get a prescription, will it require a veterinarian to come to the farm and diagnose the situation first? And that depends. So it really depends on what your relationship is at that time with a veterinarian or the clinic. If they are out there regularly, if they are familiar with your operation, then they may not need to come out and look at the sick animals or animals to determine what's the best drug. But if they haven't been out there or they haven't worked with you much, or they're not familiar with what your diagnosis is, then they'll probably feel more comfortable in going out there and doing a physical exam, determining what the diagnosis or the illness is for the animal, and then prescribing the proper medication. We want to make sure that, you know, they want to make sure that they're giving the best treatment they can for that animal. Another question is will a new prescription be required each time one purchases the same medication? And again, it depends. If say you have a seasonal issue with your calves and you've already talked to your veterinarian about um, the first case that comes along and then he prescribes an antibiotic and then a couple of weeks later, a couple of more calves get sick with the same issue most likely that veterinarian won't need to come out and look at those animals again, unless there's something else going on. So again, it depends on the comfort level between you and your veterinarian. Um, now, the prescriptions that veterinarians write will be very similar to what we see in human medicine, and they will have the option to have refills. And so that will determine um, you know, on his prescription that he writes if he will allow you to make refills. So again, that really depends between you and the veterinarian. And then will the procedure for obtaining a prescription be the same for commercial operations as for hobby and backyard operations? And the answer is yes. It's all about getting access to the drugs. It doesn't matter who it is or how big your operation is. If I have one horse in the backyard and I want to get access to something, I'm still going to have to go through a veterinarian the same as a beef operation that has 50 animals or a poultry operation that has 10 animals. It's all about making that veterinarian the gatekeeper to get access to these antibiotics. So I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things when you're establishing your relationship with your veterinarian. And this is a relationship that hopefully will bring some value to your operation. Um, you want to make sure that that veterinarian understands what your challenges are for the, the health of your animals. And when you're talking about drug usage, they should be giving you the protocols on how to use these drugs properly. I mean, there's some drugs that are better at certain things. 
and having a protocol on how to use each of these drugs that you've agreed to, to use with your vet is a good operation. Having him write up treatment protocols as well is helpful, especially if you have common issues occurring, then there's an agreement between you and your veterinarian that this is how I treat a calf respiratory or a calf ours. So then there's a bigger comfort level of what drugs you're going to be using, how you're going to be using them. And then that will go a long way with that relationship with him prescribing drugs. Um, and also record keeping is extremely important. Having a how you use the drugs written down each time that you put something into an animal. Um, and then that veterinarian can monitor that to make sure that um, the drugs are being used appropriately. And also it can help show if they're being effective. If you have to retreat an animal multiple times, then there might be a question you need to change about what drug you're using. And then inventory, again, watching your expiration dates, making sure that it's stored safely um, so that you maintain the efficacy. I, I just heard a story about a farm that was having issues with animal health. Um, they were vaccinating and doing all of these things, but nothing was making an improvement and come to find out the refrigerator had been unplugged and who knows how long, but they didn't realize that all of their whole stock of vaccines and drugs in that refrigerator had just um, been spoiled. So making sure that your storage is appropriate and working. And also if uh, you have personnel that are administering the treatments to the animals, that they are fully trained in how to administer the drugs, making sure they're getting into the animal appropriately so that you're getting maximum effectiveness of those treatments. And just from the FDA standpoint, if it's not recorded, then it did not happen. So if you ever have the issue of a residue violation, uh, they will come to your property and they will expect to see your records. And if you do not have any record keeping to show them for the treatments, then they figure you're not doing anything right and you're essentially sending uh, animals loaded with drugs into the food supply. I also wanted to mention another change that is occurring at the same time regarding cattle implants. Um, we understand that implants in cattle can improve average daily gain and improve feed efficiency. Uh, the FDA's concern is the labeling of these products that there, it's not clear whether or not you can keep implanting animals repeatedly throughout their lifespan. Uh, so on June 11th, they have asked the companies of these products to clarify their label about re-implantation within any production phase. So if the labeling states that you can have multiple implants within one production phase, then you can do that. But if it does not state that, then you can only use one implant per production phase. And the production, there's four different production phases. There's the nursing calves, there's the weaned calves, and then there's the growing steers and heifers on a dry lot. And then the last phase, which is the, the animals on confinement getting in a feedlot. So within any of those phases, unless it's stated on the label, you are only going to be able to use one implant per phase. And that's just, I just thought I would include this statement from uh, an extension person from Wisconsin that, you know, implants can be very productive. So we have to determine if we're only given one implant per production phase, timing that implant is going to be more critical. So pick the most effective time so you get the best bang for your buck for that. I also wanted to share the BQA resources. They have excellent information on their website on the new antibiotic guidelines. They have links to the American Veterinary Medical Association about what you should be looking for in a veterinarian. 
and just more of the um, information about the changes that are coming down the line. And then give you some information about the NICE Chat program. And this is a program that is offered to New York State beef and cow, beef producers and dairy producers. And we also have a small ruminant program. Um, it's a voluntary disease management program. It's based on bringing together the producer, a NICE Chat veterinarian, which is either a state veterinarian or a private veterinarian that's nice chap certified along with your herd veterinarian. So this program can create your VC, your VCPR relationship as well as through the annual visits can maintain that relationship. And the nice thing is is this program actually will pay that herd veterinarian time for some if not all of their time to visit at your farm once a year. Um, so what happens is if you wanna get on that, we do an on-farm visit. There's a discussion about you know, what's going on on your farm. What are your concerns? What are your goals? And then we come up with a plan with some simple strategies to make improvements. And that gives that veterinarian time to get to know you, get to know your operation, and then establish that relationship. And like I said, we will help defray some of that costs. It's a voluntary program. You can stay on it for as long as you want. Um, and the nice thing is, again, is you get some free consulting time between the nice chap vet and the private vet. Um, and also, if you put nice chap into the search engine, you can find our website and it will give a list of all of the state veterinarians around New York and uh, their contact information. And we work with food producing veterinarians all the time. So we might be able to help you identify vets in your area that, that you can work with. Um, we don't endorse anybody, but we can give you who's out there and you can find out who you wanna work with from that. So we can help you identify some to help create that relationship. Here is my contact information. If you have any questions about this new guidance coming into effect in June or about nice chap or um, any of the anything just give me a call or you can email me or you can text me at that number. So I guess uh, I will turn it back to Nancy and we can go over any questions. Okay, thanks Melanie. We do have some questions that were um, put in the chat. We'll start back at the top here. Uh, so online veterinarian care will not be able to prescribe for medical emergencies due to not having a VCPR? Right, so technically online veterinarians would not have a valid VCPR because they haven't had timely visits to your operation. Okay. And there is a need for large animal vets in parts of the state. How is this new regulation going to address this? Hmm. This poses a problem for smaller farms. Sometimes one needs an immediate need, but the vet practice is not available for the immediate need. Yeah, I unfortunately, I'm very familiar with there's some areas of New York that's not covered at all. And it's very difficult to find a food animal visit, uh, veterinarian. Um, I, I wish I had an answer for that. You might have to go outside of your area to identify somebody to at least make contact with, um, and they might have to drive a distance. But this new regulation is just going to compound that problem, to be honest with you. Now, you, you might uh, be able to talk to some small animal veterinarians that would be willing to work with you. Um, otherwise, it's, it's going to be looking for a practice that is as close as possible to set up a relationship with. Thanks. Back to some of the withhold information. Uh, there is a question, what is a residue violation? So food animals, um, when say beef cattle and cold dairy cattle, when they go to the market, um, they get purchased up by slaughterhouses like Cargill in Pennsylvania. And then they, when they go to the slaughterhouse, uh, there is an inspector from the USDA 
that will look over the live animal to make sure that that animal is healthy. And if there is any question about that animal, like it has a fever or if it looks off or it's lame or it's really skinny or has any signs of being treated for anything, they will flag that animal for a drug test and they will uh, scrutinize the liver, the kidney and the muscle tissue and like I said, they'll do uh, testing on that animal. They test for like over a hundred different type of chemicals. A lot of it is for antibiotics. And if they do find a positive residue from an antibiotic or any other drug, then that's considered a residue. And then the, uh, they'll trace that animal back to the farm and they'll send you a nasty letter, usually a three page dressing down that you sent an animal with a drug residue and they will ask for, you know, are you aware of this? Um, you need to tell us why this happened and how you're gonna make sure it doesn't happen again. And they may actually send out an FDA inspector to your farm to look at your records and look at how you're using drugs. And in the past, they have actually visited the veterinarian who works with that farm and inspected them as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I, th this needs just a little clarification. The NICE chap program is only for cattle operations? Pretty much, um, it's for beef, it's for dairy. Um, we have small room at sheep and goats. We have some bison and some deer herds on there. Um, it's not a, it's because of the diseases are more of a herd disease management program. Um, it's, it's not fit for swine. We don't have any information for swine or for poultry in there. Okay. Uh, regarding the VFT, VFD, excuse me, how, for how long the VFD prescriptions are good? Still six months or a year? I believe it's still six months for that. That has not changed. Um, the, the regulations still remain as they were when in 2017. Okay. So a residue violation doesn't affect homesteaders or hobby farms. Not really. If you, unless you're sending your animals to a facility that is USDA inspected, um, or the facility that you're sending the animals to be processed does any testing, which I don't know if they would or not, but if they're USDA inspected, they're, they would be um, looked at, but if they're not, probably not. Okay. Unless there's a complaint. Any other questions? I can um, turn off the recording and if you wanna raise your hand, I can unmute you if you'd rather ask, you know, out loud. Um, let's see, there's one more. Still a requirement that the vet need to sign a farm protocol and review it once a year? So that's not a requirement um, unless that particular veterinarian wants to do it. Now, there is no requirement that the VCPR has to be written. However, um, because of all of these changes, I think some veterinarians and some clinics are requiring a written agreement be signed between them and the client. So again, it, it really is vet dependent. Um, now there's, if you're a dairy and you're in the farm program, which is um, a program through National Milk, they require written statements that you have a relationship. So there's, but if you're, if you're not a dairy, if you're a beef farm, if you're a hobbyist, um, just having that veterinarian uh, out at your farm implies that you have a relationship with that veterinarian. And again, it will be vet dependent as to how often they feel they need to be out there um, for timely visits. Okay, any others? Oh, here comes one more. Any help or grants for farmers who may need to now invest in more animal handling equipment? 
unless there's something through BQA, however. You know, yeah, yeah, I can kind of chime in on this. There is um, the John May Safety Grant. It's through the New York Center for Ag and Medicine. I can't remember. Um, but you can apply for a grant and they will help pay for safety equipment on the farm. And uh, I know a lot of farms use that to purchase cattle handling systems or animal handling systems. Um, since um, there were some links that were in your presentation, Melanie, I can send out some of those links and that John May safety grant information out to everybody sometime either this week or early next week and um, just provide that information. Just as a little helpful, more helpful to have it in an email, just easier to find unless you're really good at doing searches. Yes. Um, yeah. We got another question here. If we only have 10 calves, do we need to have the vet stop at our farm? Probably, um, unless you find a vet that knows you there in order for you for them to prescribe you medication, they'll probably want to see those 10 calves. Yeah. And yes, um, I will share the recording of this um, afterwards. And I guess, Melanie, it's up to you. Would you be willing to share your presentation as well? Sure. Yeah, that would be no problem. And I will add one thing. Um, if you're if you've heard of the New York Grown and Certified program, it is a program through New York State to identify farms uh, producing food that stays within New York or that produces food in New York State. And it's a designation to help with marketing and it might open some doors with um, different markets and designations, but they have a grant for helping farms um, with technology and it might include help with handling facilities and it might be an avenue if you're interested in joining something like that or if you already are. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, you'll <clears throat> excuse me. You'll have my email address when I send out some information later. If you have questions, and I can send them on to Dr. Hemingway, or she has your her email address right there on the screen. If you want to jot that down. Um, thank you all for sitting in tonight. I know it's a it's going to be a a burden on our farms, but that was part of the reason that we wanted to hold this tonight to help work through some of the questions, some of the concerns. Um, I think even some of our extension offices, you know, the livestock educators may have some suggestions on local veterinarians. You know, we try to keep track of some of that. We might be able to help with that as well. So thanks again. Thanks. Dr. Hemingway for your time tonight and thanks everybody for sitting in. And um, you know, just another one popped up. Oh, let me stop the recording.